alternate location. Um, Jerry is here. Everybody here knows Jerry, so I'm not going to read his resume. But if anybody wants it, let me know. I'll email it to you. Um, Jerry is here to talk about the best steak houses in the United States. He's been all over. <laughs> and he can tell us where to go and where to avoid. So, um, Actually, he's going to talk to us about um, the treatment of Ponzi schemes in bankruptcy, correct? Correct. So with that, Jerry, take it away. Okay. Uh, let's figure out how this works. Ponzi schemes in bankruptcy. Uh, Ponzi schemes, basically right now, it's still a good growth industry. I mean, if you want to be in on it, now's a good time to get to the ground floor. Uh, the economy's been slow. Interest rates, especially for the blue-collar retirees, 1.5%, 2%. It's a great time because now you can do a Ponzi scheme. You don't have to offer 11, 12 percent anymore. You can do it five or six percent. People are going to jump in. So it makes it real good. Very opportunities. Uh, I think, on, just like Southwest Florida, bankruptcy all over the nation has just slowed down. I think we all know there's not a lot of good Chapter 11 cases floating around. Unless you're in the oil field, oil field services. Maybe if you're in the Catholic Church. Uh, there's some good cases going around, but uh, we don't see them down here. Locally, I'd say what I've seen predominantly has been farming cases. Uh, I think in the last year we've handled three tomato cases and one strawberry case. And uh, I don't know whether it's NAFTA. I think NAFTA has a lot to do with it. The, uh, the weather has not been helpful. And you take January with 10 inches of rain, that didn't help anything either. So. Just locally, it's been slow. Uh, my observation is that the real estate is starting to slow down. The certain segments, not, not across the board, but certain segments of the real estate is uh, are slowing down. So, what would I say? Hopefully, real estate will really turn bad and we'll all get back into business. Uh, also, at this time, the time's gone out, the tide's gone out, what's left? What's left is the bottom. What we're seeing is the bottom. Uh, on our website, we have two Ponzi blogs, Ponzi uh, sites. You'll, if you go to those sites, you'll see that Ponzi's typically, they're running 40 to 50 a month uh, nationally. Uh, there's a attorney in LA, Kathy Phelps. She puts out a very good blog. And there's also a, an attorney up in Tampa, and probably, I don't know whether you know Bert Wyand or not, but Bert does a lot of uh, Ponzi type work or securities fraud work, and their firm uh, puts together a pretty good site. Uh, let's see. Ponzi schemes. I don't think we have to go through this, but this basically Ponzi schemes, Security Exchange Commission, Ponzi scheme, investment fraud payment of purported returns to existing investors from new investors. Organizers often solicit investors by promising to invest funds, opportunities, claim to generate returns with little or no risk. That's, I mean, that's easy. That's a, a great thing to do. Uh, I guess everybody would like that. Ninth Circuit Court, uh, Wiley versus Ryder. I've seen this one throughout throughout the country being cited in the Ponzi scheme cases, and that's Ponzi scheme fraudulent other arrangements. That I've talked about. Uh, again, I think everybody here understands Ponzi schemes, so there's no need to beat that to death. Uh, a Ponzi scheme, a Ponzi fund. Interesting enough, when I first saw this, I thought that's a good cartoon, but then as I thought about it, I don't know how many Ponzi funds I've had. Uh, and what's a Ponzi fund? A Ponzi fund is a fund that really doesn't work. What they do is they'll bring in money purport to do something, they might even do it. But the problem is they might run out of money. So if they run out of money before what they want to do, build a building, build a condo, an apartment complex, what they do is they go back out and create fund number two. And they use the money from fund number two to complete fund number one, pay some dividends out to fund number one people, they feel good, they tell their friends. So we go on to fund number three. And it just rolls like that. Uh, I believe we're in involved in one now in Texas that's like that. Uh, 90, I believe there's 99 different funds that they've set up along the way to support the fund underneath it, the fund underneath it, the fund underneath it. 
uh, locally. We had one where it was uh, limited partnerships. A limited partnership would build a building, run out of money, but so before they could finish it, started a limited partnership. We have uh, one right now out of Palm Beach. It's an offshoot of the Petters case. And there we have two major funds, but there were funds started and it's one fund ran out of money or couldn't get the returns. We got fund number two. And sometimes fund number one was just used to prime the pump, generate enough money so that they could make what I call lulling payments to keep fund number one happy. Fund number one people, they go out to fund number two and say, this is a great deal, my mother's in it. So fund number two people come in and put in their money to follow them. If you go way back, uh, I'm showing my age with you, go way back, there was, a, back in the 80s, there was the fund of funds. That was probably the original Ponzi fund of funds. Uh, I can't remember who the fellow was. I remember that he wound up in uh, Costa Rica and uh, never did get extradited. He did a good, nice job. Uh, red flags. High return, little or no risk, obvious. Overly consistent returns. Overly consistent returns. I think we have the best example, our friend Mr. Madoff. Consistency is a virtue only but applied with logic. So there he goes, and every month he's turning out those 12% returns. The market's going down, it's down 6%, it's down 8%. He's still up there. He made off is still generating his 12%. Um, unregistered investments. That's probably the genesis of most of the investments that I see. That's the perpetrator really doesn't have any background, really doesn't know much about securities. His investors know even less, so he convinces the investors, this is a good deal. Uh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Now's your chance to get in. Affinity groups. Affinity groups are a major headache. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Wall Street Journal yesterday, probably in sports magazines. Some sports, sports stars just got taken for $22 million. The reason why they got taken was their, their promoter indicated that uh, he was a good Christian man, and uh, since they were good Christians, it would be good to invest with them and they could do good things with their money. The affinity groups are very, very, very difficult to crack. Uh, unlicensed sellers, almost everyone that I've had. The people selling the security or selling the investment are not licensed brokers. They occasionally run into that, but most of the time, they're used car sales people type. Uh, get in now, get in today, get that money in now, we need it today. Uh, not standard paperwork. If you're dealing in the brokerage area, I think all of us that have any uh, securities accounts, you're Paper always comes up. Uh, landscape? Landscape. In Madoff and in a lot of the other ones in uh, Perlman, the statements came up rather than landscape portrait. Big brokerage houses do not use portrait, they only use landscape. If you have a client getting those statements and the statements are in uh, portrait, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm thinking it's a red flag. I'm saying it's a red flag. You ought to really take a look at it. Uh, Non-standard paperwork, we've got difficulty in receiving payments. Ponzi's work real good until they don't work anymore. And usually that difficulty in receiving payments is the first sign that you're in a problem with a Ponzi. Complex strategies, I don't think we have to go any further than uh, made off with his covered options. The, uh, the strategy really didn't exist. Uh, but it sounded good. It sounded good until you peeled back the first layer of the onion and realized that it could have existed. But that's another thing that with the complex strategies, the investor really has no feel for what is a good strategy. And he's relying on the perpetrator to protect him. And they protect him. Madoff, uh, consistent returns, complex strategies. Perlman, uh, I think y'all, I don't know if you know, Lou Pearl when I had that case. And I, I, I had this receiver, uh, Sadiq Capella had it as 
bankruptcy trustee. No complex strategy, just steal the money. It's uh, very straightforward. I love it. Uh, Promise, by the way, wound up with a 25 year sentence, and the judge indicated that he would take a million dollars, take a year off for every million dollars that uh, was returned. And so far, nothing has been returned, so I believe he still has probably about 20 years left to go in the sentence. Um, for soda. Up in Bradenton, we had a case where an individual was selling fractionalized mortgages, an unregistered security to unsophisticated people using affinity. Uh, he'd go to the, the nurses, he'd go to the uh, American Legion, the Eagles Clubs, and he was using those. And once he got it rolling, they'd tell their friends and they'd tell their friends. Uh, that turned out to be a uh, $128 million fraud. Uh, I think the only reason why that one broke is the guy died. If the guy didn't die, I think he could have kept the thing rolling. Uh, and it was strictly a Ponzi. He was making investments, but the investments he was making, was they were returning 10%, and uh, he was paying 12%. So a bigger truck would not have helped him. I mean, the, the more he, uh, the longer he stayed around, the more he made, the deeper he got. Interestingly enough, $128 million scheme, he was carrying $20 million in cash on his balance sheet. And he had $20 million in cash. The regulators thought, that's great, look, the guy has $20 million. Never did they stop and think, wait a minute, he has $128 million in debt out there that he's paying 10% on. He's getting like 6% on his cash, 10% on the investment. And I've got $20 million sitting there uninvested. How does it work? And the answer is, it doesn't. Uh, Lancer. Lancer is an unusual case. I'm, I'm going to bore you all with a few cases here, so I hope you don't mind. But Lancer was a, probably the first hedge fund, major hedge fund fraud out of New York. It's a billion dollar fraud. Uh, it's been going on now for 12 or 13, the case has been going, ongoing for 12 or 13 years. We're liquidating trustees in that. It was a, uh, up and up and Ponzi scheme combined. And what the individual would do, they would buy penny stocks during the quarter. And they'd buy a large number, maybe two million, three million uh, shares of a uh, company stock, and maybe they're paying 11 cents a share. Just before the end of a quarter, they'd go in and they'd buy 500 shares for five bucks a share. And then under mark to market, they would write up the shares that they purchased during the quarter to market. The surprising part on that, the frustrating part on that, it has been going for 12 or 13 years. Virtually all the perpetrators were indicted, except for the chief perpetrator. And he's gotten away with it. He wound up being found, uh, I guess, not guilty. Uh, and it, I'd say the, the U.S. Attorney's Office just put on too damn much information. They lost the jury. It was a straightforward case that they should have, it should have been a slam dunk. And they lost it. Worse than that, of all the pyramid schemes or Ponzi schemes or unregistered security schemes that I've had, this is the only one where I really feel the guy wound up taking money, actually winding up with money. He's from uh, Eastern Bloc country. Um, his brother is a car dealer in uh, someplace over there, Slovakia someplace, and uh, there's a lot of money missing. And he currently does not have a job. He lives on an apartment on the east, uh, on the east side of New York. Uh, it, it's a sin. It's a, it's a real sin. It's, well, most of the time, so most of these Ponzi schemes, there's no money left at the end. It, it's gone. Uh, it, it either went back to the earlier investors or, in most instances, the individual who perpetrated the Ponzi scheme wound up uh, living a good life May have been a short one, a short time for a short time, but they lived a good life while they could. Um, on the affinities, we have one in California called Sing, S I N G H. That's in Sacramento. And in Sing, Sing was a uh, Indian Fiji, Fijian. And he got all Indian Fijians to invest with him in the area. And the nice part for him was the Indian Fijians don't necessarily live by the rules of the U.S. government. And as far as filing tax returns and keeping 
information on where their money came from or how much money they had. They couldn't prove that they even had money to put into the Ponzi scheme. So it turned out that uh, he got sentenced to 20 years. The investors will wind up actually suffering from clawbacks. There'll be very little to go around when this gets done. It'll be absolutely pennies on the dollar if that. Um, probably uh, one of the biggest cases, well, probably the big, not dollar-wise, but the biggest case I've had is the 1031 tax group out of New York. And it, it's cited in a lot of the Ponzi scheme cases. It's cited in a lot of cases uh, in the bankruptcy area. That's interesting from the standpoint that there were no investors. Uh, there was a uh, about $50 million in losses with absolutely no investors. The people were not investors. There were people who put their money in 1031 exchange companies to facilitate uh, property turnover, property transfers tax-free. The individual gets involved, guy from Miami, and uh, he winds up buying the company, buying the uh, intermediary. And the first thing he does when he buys the intermediary, they probably have 30, 40 million dollars in cash, uh, in escrow, in escrow. And uh, so the first thing he does is pull that out and lends it to one of his other companies. Well, it's time for the closings. He doesn't have the money to do the closing. So like any good Ponzi scheme operator, he goes out and he finds another intermediary and acquires that. And before you know it, he has five intermediaries. Uh, spread from Boston to California. Uh, he's now serving 100 years. I guess he's down to probably 97 left to go. But uh, it was a it was a tough one because again the people never went in for an investment. They really went in uh, as investors. They really were putting their money. They thought in escrow. Sure. Is that the one that was on American Greed? That yeah that that uh, that one did show up on American Greed. Uh, we didn't get we didn't get much uh, play out of that one because we were fairly successful and we recovered 67 cents on the dollar for all the unsecured investors. And uh, when you get a return over 15 or 16 cents on the dollar in a Ponzi scheme, that's a, it's close to a miracle. And when you get 67 cents on the dollar in a Ponzi scheme, it, it's it's not a miracle. God has really shined down on you and said, "I'm going to give him the gold ring." I mean, it was just a, it was good. It was. Life doesn't get much better than that, with the exception of Land America Exchange Services. Land America Exchange Services was a public company, a subsidiary of uh, Land America Title Company, probably well, it was the largest title insurer in the United States. As an ancillary business, they got into intermediary, uh, intermediate 1031 exchanges and qualified intermediaries. And he had a situation where we don't have any Ponzi uh, investors, what we have is Ponzi victims. The way this one happened in 2008 when the market went to hell on everybody, um, the company had all of its escrow funds invested in student loan auction rate securities. And by investing in student loan auction rate securities, they were achieving a return probably maybe a half a percent better than they would have if they just had it in the bank. The market in February of 2008 froze completely. There was no market for student loan option rate securities. There was no place they could sell the paper. Uh, not being able to do that, they continued to operate, and they operated by taking in new funds, and using the new funds to pay out for the closings of those funds that were frozen. Uh, a very complex case, very complex case, and we were exceptionally blessed on that. Uh, we wound up recovering 100 cents on the dollar for the investors, and, and this is really unusual, we wound up getting 67, 68% for consequential damages for those that could prove a consequential damage claim. We wound up recovering $350 million on about a $300 million deal. Uh, it was just uh, the best I've ever had. The judge indicated that he thought it was impossible. He thought the case was 
tested for failure. He couldn't believe the results. It was, it was just great. He was out of, out of Richmond, Virginia. Um, locally, capital first. This was a Ponzi scheme out of uh, College Parkway. And locally, locally being Sarasota and Fort Myers, they got about $25 million. Nationally, it was part of a larger scheme out of Texas, and the total scheme was well over $50 million. It was a three-pronged uh, scam. First prong was viaticles. And if you're familiar with viaticles, what these people did, and you might well expect, they got some doctor and they paid the doctor 25 bucks a head to say that these people are going to die from cancer and that's a good time to buy their policies. Well, the doctor wasn't real. The patients were real, but they weren't sick. And uh, I forget how much they got out of that particular portion. Second portion, the sale of unregistered securities. Another great one. The unregistered securities they were selling were uh, supported by used, used cars in Dallas, Texas. And so when the, when the scheme collapsed, uh, the receiver on that one fell out of uh, FCI in Texas. He, he said he, it was impossible to get any payments on the things. It was just absolute blood in the streets. Interestingly, on, the, on that one, the individual, the perpetrator out of Texas, did get sentenced to, I believe it was 20 years, and then tried to put a hit out on the federal judge. And they caught him on the hit on the federal judge, so he's in for a long, long time at this point. The third part, the third part I really liked, was a penny stock, what we call pump and dump. Buy, buy the stock very cheap, get on the phone, pump the stock up, sell it. Well, the company that they were selling this investment in had valuable land in uh, Belize. No, Honduras, Honduras. So we, we started to do some investigation, and uh, we started with Honduras, and Honduras, so Property records aren't too good in the Honduras Public Record Department. So we talked to a few people and they said, oh yeah, that property. Go down to the dump and make a right. And that's, that was the quality of the property. It was just right next to the dump. But it, it sold. I mean, it was a, a good fodder for uh, the investment. Uh, let's see what else we got here. It can pay well. Short range, but it can pay well. This is a, a yacht that uh, belonged to the fellow that did the 1031 tax group scam. It's a 138 footer. Uh, we sold it for nine, nine and a half million. Uh, he had paid 12 million for it. Uh, unfortunately, I think it was first union, it was owed 10 million. So we, got, we cut a deal in, uh, with first union where they let us retain, I forget what the number was, 700,000, 800,000, even though we were underwater. I guess that's a poor thing on a boat. <laughs> that's where we were. I loved it. Unfortunately, I never got to ride that. Uh, the master's, whoops, take it back. The main salon, great. The uh, the deck, out of this world. This was interesting. We had to uh, do the transaction offshore for reasons of, I, I guess, when it comes to yacht sales, you have to do the transaction this size. You couldn't do it in intercontinental water, in continental water. You had to go offshore to sell it. Uh, and again, unfortunately, I never got to ride the boat. I, I, I don't think I ever saw it. Most people in my office was on the but I don't think I ever got to see it. Um, on this one, this boat was costing me $40,000 a month in dockage fees in Miami. In addition, because it was over 100 feet, I was required to maintain a full uh, staff. So I had four, uh, four crew members, captain, uh, some boat hands, an engineer, and uh, I was glad, believe me, to, to, to let that go.
in addition to his yacht. These were the cars that we got. And I love this one because I'm, I'm a car guy. But, uh, oh, let's see. Starting in the back row, that's an Aston Martin, Ferrari, uh, Porsche, Bentley, a NASCAR stock car, a uh, Lamborghini, naturally you have to have a Rolls Royce, a Sunbeam Tiger, uh, an aqua car, uh, what we call a clown car. A, uh, uh, this is this is for real, it's a Cobra, but it's a kid car, it wasn't a real Cobra. And another Ferrari. In addition, we had the, the 43 foot boat in the back. We also had uh, this is a classic wood boat. And had uh, a his and hers motorcycle back there too. Uh, in addition, he also had at his house over on Star Island, that's Hibiscus Island over in Miami. He also had three other cars that we didn't we didn't get a hold of. In addition, he had three Indy cars, uh, but we could get the title on the Indy cars. And actually, on the Indy car, it's really only the tub. It's not really the whole car. But supposedly, he had somebody do some work, and that individual took the tubs and painted them. Um, in addition, if this wasn't enough, I also sold in this case. Two Gulfstream jets, a Learjet, and a helicopter. <laughs> this guy lived at large. This is the one that was on the. Uh, <laughs> and he, as you might expect, not only did he live large, if you ever get see his, uh, if you ever see the uh, American Greed on this, he married a Brazilian escort, 23, 24 years old, and uh, it, it's just to see his wedding on. American Creed is just a thing of beauty. They have the, the dog dressed up as a bride. He, he says that he was a drummer for a rock group, but we never could confirm that he was that. What's, what's that? Um, when you get into these things, one of the biggest problems in Ponzi schemes is recovery. And recovery, low hanging fruit. One of the biggest problems you have, usually when you get in here, there's nothing here. I mean, you're, you're, you're starting with nothing. So you want to grab the low-hanging fruit as quick as possible. In the case of the 1031, in the 1031 case, not only was there nothing there, we had already had, uh, they already had $12 million in administrative fees chopped up, unpaid. So the case was administratively insolvent when we took it on. One of the things we did was challenge all four of the professional firms that provided, uh, provided work during the bankruptcy prior to my appointment back when it was in debtor possession and the judge disallowed all their fees, $12 million. So that was good. I, I like that. Uh, on the low hanging fruit, 9019 quick compromises. Again, you're, you're running on empty, so you've got to do something quick. If you can find some low hanging fruit and you can get it in for a quick 9019, you're going to have to make some compromises here. You're going to probably let things go a little bit on the cheap side. Now is the time to do it because you have to have the war chest. If you don't have the war chest, you're nothing. You're, 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 you're dead meat. So where do we look? First of all, deep pockets, the insurance companies. <coughs> do you know insurance? Excess liability insurance? Crime policies? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, when the agencies themselves, did the agency provide the perpetrator or the perpetrating company the correct policies uh, in the Latin America, no, in the uh, 1031 case, the agency on 1031 kicked in, I believe it was around $17 million. Uh, on the excess liability insurance, I love this one, the excess liability, in the Latin America case, there was Land America Financial Group, which I was not a part of, and Land America Exchange Services, which was the subsidiary. We had a lot of negotiations as to who claim was what, whose claim belonged to who, Land America Financial Group of Services. In our earliest negotiations, we wound up giving them a little, I call it favorable treatment on the DNO insurance. And they felt that there really wasn't a good excess liability claim. And they allowed us, or we, we negotiated where they got the first million dollars of the excess, and we got anything over that. As it turns out, the DNO insurance paid out, paid out handsome. I believe the DNO, 
I don't know, 12 million, 13 million. We got, I forget what the share was, but we got a good share of that. But on the excess liability, the excess liability paid $40 million. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that the trustee for. Is that separate coverage, Jerry? I mean, or is that built into CGL or whatever? Excuse the me. Excess liability, is that a separate coverage? Or is yes, separate in? coverage. Matter of fact, um, uh, it's a good point, but I'll, I'll cover that. On the excess liability, it is separate coverage. On the larger companies, you're going to have not just one excess liability coverage, but you're going to the carrier, you're going to probably have a group of them to deal with. At that point, you get into what they call towers of insurance. And whose tower covers how much and in what conditions? And that's part of the strategy that you need to work out is which company am I going to go after? And when I go after that company, is it going to cause other companies to join forces with me? Or are they going to go against me? In both the 1031 case and in the Land America case, I used a law firm called Gilbert Company out of Washington, D.C. And they were superior. As a matter of fact, I got them from uh, Jeff Warren. I don't know how many know Jeff, but Jeff had the asbestos cases. And, uh, Jeff wound up using them on the asbestos cases. So these guys knew what they were doing, and it was a real pleasure. Because when we got into the excess liability, we wound up in arbitration in Washington, D.C. And I believe there was about 12 carriers represented there in addition to Land America Financial Group and us. And when my attorney came in from Gilbert Group, the mediator arbitrator out of California, federal judge, ex-federal judge, knew my guy just like that, knew our reputation. It really went a long way towards getting us the settlement that we wanted. Um, law firms, great area in the Ponzi area, great, great area for recovery, uh, malpractice, and aiding and abetting. And in the 1031 case on aiding and abetting, we got a uh, firm in Miami to their, their malpractice carrier cuts a check for 10 million policy limits on day one. And the uh, firm itself kicked in, I think the partners kicked in about another 2 million, and then the firm broke up one week later. Um, on law firms, in the 1031 case, I believe we reached settlement with about four or five law firms, uh, some as high as seven million dollars. Um, uh, most of those were in the malpractice area. Accounting firms, malpractice. Malpractice is great for accountants. I mean, that's a, if you can get them, and if you have the accounting firm that has the coverage or has the ability to write the check, or an insurance company with the ability to write the check. Uh, certainly, but you, ideally, what you would want would be a uh, big four, final four uh, accounting firm, PwC, uh, KPG, PMAR, somebody like that that really has something to lose from the standpoint, not just money, but from the standpoint of reputation. A lot of this, you, uh, I guess maybe I, I don't so much go get about the law, it's more into psychology. What's going to get these people to the table? And a lot of times, the big, big companies, big banks, the reputational fear is going to get to the table. And it's a good, good way to do it. Um, financial institutions, aiding and abetting, I'll get to that, and know your customer. Uh, for the KYC, know your customer, that's the federal regulations. The bank is supposed to know for unusual transactions or unusual activity, what gives rise to it? Do they really know their customer? And believe me, this is a ripe area. In the uh, Land America uh, group, Land America case, we got Citibank to kick in 100 million. We got SunTrust to kick in 45 million, 40, 45 million. And in the, uh, the 1031 case in New York, we got, at the time I believe it was First Union, for 40 million, 45 million. Uh, chapter 5 recoveries, I'll go to that, but just a couple quick things. So chapter 5 recoveries, most of the time, the court will allow you to break out the victims from the trade creditors. If you can, you want to get the trade creditors out of the way because you don't want to be bothered with them with all the mailings and everything like that. Just get them out of there. Deal with the, uh, deal with the victims separate. In our big cases, we set up uh, websites. 
and other websites we post periodically what's happening in the case. I do it for two reasons. Number one, it avoids having to do massive mail-outs. But number two, it avoids the incoming telephone calls. If you keep up, keep up to date, keep it posted, it does help. Now, unfortunately, in the Ponzi scheme area, you're going to get a lot of situations where what you have is unsophisticated investors, blue collar retirees, poor people. They didn't deserve to be where they're at. They got a little greedy, a little greed on both sides, but they got hurt. They got hurt real bad. And so you need to be sympathetic and empathetic. You have to really talk to them on the phone. You can't just say, oh, screw it, I'm not going to call him back. He's paying the ass. You can't, you just can't do it. You got you to live with them. You got to try and make them feel good. You got to try and make them understand that you didn't do it. It wasn't your fault. You're there trying to work out for them, not against them. Uh, on the 1031 case, they set up a group called what they called the train yard victims. And they were their own worst enemies. And they fought me for they're still fighting me. Uh, and they just uh, they just continue to cause additional time and expense to be incurred, and it's not going to get them anywhere. If you're the first one in, first one out, Ponzi schemes can be lucrative. I had uh, one individual, this was before I knew a little bit more about this, but I had one individual in the Persona case that indicated to me this was his 10th Ponzi scheme that he invested in. And he said, you know, not bad, one in 10, look at the money I made, you know. And so he was, he'd always try to be early in, early out. know your customer, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but if you get in a situation where you have a financial institution and you have unusual transactions or what appear to be unusual transactions, go after them. Go for the jugular. Uh, they don't like they don't like to be seen, they don't like to be on the radar screen. They're a great source of revenue. They're a good, great source of cash. 9019s all the time. We use them uh, settlement just has to fall within the reasonable range of litigation possibilities. In fact, I think it says reasonable range. Most courts will go for the lowest possible range. So it works in your favor if you want to get settled. Uh, even if you have to cut something, if you have to cut a deal, it's a good time to do it, a good way to do it. Usually in the 9019, these are standard. You're going to see them down here. I guess we have Justice Oaks in uh, New York. We have Iridium. They all have the same. Probability of success, probability of collection, how much delay is the selling the interest of creditors. Yeah, an interesting one on the uh, Land America case. No, no, I'm sorry, the Petters case. The Petters case, on, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with Petters. Petters was also on uh, American Greed. But Petters was uh, buying uh, white goods, supposedly at great discounts and overstocks and selling them to Sam's, Costco, and things like that. Well, at one point in time, he had GECC in for, what was it, over 100 million? 50? And the trustee for Petters settled with GECC right out of the box for 19 million bucks. And it was a sin because there were really GECC, I mean, he had them. Were, GECC, I believe, knew that there was a Ponzi scheme. They knew it was a scheme, and what they did was they let the scheme run because they wanted to get paid out. So they wanted Petters to go out, raise more money, and get them out of here. So I think he just had a great case against them. But if you remember one of the earlier slides, it takes money. And he didn't have the money, so he went in, he did 1919 very early, got 20 million, 19 million dollars for him. Uh, in that, this was his first case. This was his first case. It was a uh, good guy, but really his first case, not a lot of experience. He had enough there that he could have gotten in and gotten good financing to finance the case against GECC, and he would have, he probably would have gotten well up into the six nine figures, hundred million. Uh, problems. 
in par delecto, uh, I'm not an attorney and uh, don't profess to be one, but in par delecto is essentially you're standing in the shoes of the debtor and the bad deeds of the debtor are attributed to you and it makes it very difficult to go back for clawbacks and things like that. Uh, and also, if you're up in some, some districts, you have what's called the Wagner Rule. The Wagner Rule is uh, primarily second, uh, second DCA in uh, New York says, I don't care if you're a trustee, there's no way, there's no way you're going to get the claims. Uh, you, there's, the defendant is going to walk because of the Wagner Rule and prior to lecto type. What I've done is generally these type of claims are going to be, whether it's derivative claims or direct claims, and typically I try and form an allegiance very early on with a class action attorney. Because I want to be able to go into negotiations and mediations from the standpoint that they have me as trustee or they have him as class action attorney, so I don't care which way they go, we're going to get recovery. They say the claim doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the group, and I have the group with me. Uh, if they say uh, it doesn't belong to the group, it belongs to me, but I'm here. So in, I guess in 1031 primarily, just about every mediation we went to, it was both us and the class attorney. Uh, it worked out very well for us. It worked out very well for the class attorney. He didn't do a heck of a lot. He got a big check. But uh, it did work out good for the victims. Oh, we're going to have distributions. Distributions are a pain in the neck, especially in the larger cases. Uh, you can imagine 1,900, 2,000 victims trying to figure out what you're going to do on the distributions. There's three general methods used for distributions. One is the last statement method. In Ponzi schemes, this is the worst possible one because the claim is equal to whatever was on the last statement. It doesn't make any difference whether that, that last statement had uh, just all synthetic interest income or that. That's going to be the basis of the, uh, for the claim. The net investment method, that's probably what I would call the most popular. And that's you get the net winners and the net losers. And uh, the amount of the claim will be the net amount that the individual invested. That is to say, if he invested uh, half a million and he got back 100000 the claim's 400000 the last one, the rising tide method. The rising tide method attempts to make all investors come out percentage-wise of pari per The uh, I don't like the rising tide method. It's very complex and extremely difficult to explain. Having said that, I'll try it just a little bit. On the rising tide method, the denominator is the total investments, not the claim amount but the total investments. And what the, the first pass of the rising tide is for that investor that got back zero, his first, the first distribution of the case go to him to bring him to the level of the next individual. So if the first individual got nothing back and the next individual got 10% back, the first individual will get 10% of his claim until he's part pursued with that other 10%. Then the fun begins because then you go to the third one that might be a 15 percent or a 20 percent. Extremely complex. The recent case last last month um, in New Mexico, where 98 percent of the plan uh, participants agreed with the rising tide method, and the judge said no, he didn't like it because it was taking the earlier date, not the claim amount and threw it out. Uh, I think a lot of bankruptcy judges will throw it out because it's not equity. It really, it's not an equitable solution. Unfortunately, while it's not an equitable solution, the uh, federal district courts and receiverships prefer the rising tide method. Uh, again, it, it's, it's extremely difficult, and I really don't know how they do it when they wind up with a mass uh, group of creditors, 5,000, 10,000 creditors. I don't know how they really do it. Um, clawbacks, I thought we corrected that, but we had. Um, 
easy to lose sight. I didn't mean foreclose and get foreclosed off the site. It should have been S-I-G-H-T. But um, the objective of the game is to maximize the return. It, it's not to win. Mm -hmm. Winning is winning's great. I guess Charlie Sheen, winning, winning. I don't worry about winning. I want to maximize the return. And there are certain instances where the clawback, even though you can do it, doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, in the uh, Versota case, so the case had 67, 68% recovery. What's a clawback going to do? It's going to bring money into the estate, but at the same time, it's going to bring it's going to bring debt into the estate. How much time is it going to take to do the clawback? How much is it going to cost an attorney's fees? How much is it going to delay closing the case? And yes, some people might get away with a little bit more. In the long run, it's worth it. Um, very low overall return. If you have a situation where you have very low overall return, you've got to return 2%, 3% dividend to the creditors. Does it really make a difference to the creditors whether you return it 2% or 4%? Get the case closed. Don't bother with it. Um, again, a very high return. If you have a very high return, again, don't bother with it because you're just going to you're going to spend a lot of money on attorney's fees and it's not really going to benefit the estate. However, good way to reduce claims. I think on, on the clawbacks, you know, we send letters out to everybody. Send the money back. If I can't get anything else, what I want is the creditor to say, well, I'll drop the claim. And if nothing else, maybe they'll cut my uh, claim register from 1,000 claims down to 800 claims. That's 200 that I don't have to deal with. Uh, Ponzi scheme. Provided you didn't only keep your mouth shut. One of the little tricks on Ponzi schemes, if you're unfortunate enough to have the investor, the investor should not know about the Ponzi scheme. The investor should be innocent. And uh, caution people that if you think it's an if you think it's a Ponzi scheme and you investigate the Ponzi scheme and then take your money out, you're dead meat. You're subject to the uh, clawback, and generally the court's not going to look favorably on it. It's, it's sort of a, an anomaly, if you will, because the guy made the investment, he does his homework, finds out it's bad, he takes the money out, and he gets screwed. The guy that makes the investment doesn't do his homework, takes his money out, he lost. So it's just an interesting way, interesting anomaly. Uh, if you get into these governmental agencies, FBI, nice people, but no help. And if you dealt with the FBI, it's a one-way street. The information all goes in, nothing comes out. Worse than that, some of the information you may need for the case went in, and you'll never see it again, and you're done. U.S. Attorney, develop a relationship. And do this early in the case. What you want with the U.S. Attorney is you want an agreement with the U.S. Attorney that as trustee, you're going to be allowed to do the collections and do the distributions. Uh, you really don't want them running in grabbing the assets. Uh, a couple reasons for that, but number one, if you're the trustee, you're going to get paid. Get the assets in your corner. Another anomaly, another bad situation, you have the claims. As the bankruptcy trustee, you're dealing with the claims for the bankruptcy court. Um, if there's a class action group, the class action group, and you need to get in early, might do their own solicitation of claims. And that solicitation may produce a different number than what you have in the bankruptcy claims. And then worse than that, you get the federal government involved with restitution claims. And that is it's a nightmare. It's a total nightmare. We have been asked by a number of the U.S. Attorney's offices to go ahead and do the processing of the claims because they don't want to do it. Also, Sue, with my office here, today received a great fruit basket from the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in Virginia, thanking her for all the work that she did in getting their restitution claims settled. Um, U.S. Marshal's Office, if you lose assets to the U.S. Marshal's Office, forget about it and forget about recovery and from your uh, Victim standpoint, forget about recovery too. They are probably the worst people I know 
with respect to actually getting getting recoveries on the sale of assets. U.S. Postal Inspector Inspectors, they'll be involved in just about every case because in every case you have some type of uh, money laundering. So they're good people. They'll work with you. Um, just uh, off offsite, off hand, England. England has what they call the serious fraud office. I often wonder whether they have a funny fraud office to go with a serious fraud office. But they are the most the best people I've ever worked with. They actually send people from England over to meet with us, bringing over all their records and laying out what they see the plan to be and laying out what they thought the scheme was. And I point out offshore, if money goes offshore, you're on your own. Uh, I've heard of some recoveries offshore, but you better have a lot of money offshore that you're going after because it's extremely expensive, extremely difficult. On offshore, you need Norwich Pharmacal order, and that's one that served on innocent third parties that allowed us to discover to proceed. I've got a bank in Luxembourg. I want, I want to get their records. I need to serve them with a Norwich Pharmacal order. Moravia injunctions, even tougher. Moravia injunctions allow you to freeze the assets in a foreign country. They are extremely difficult to get. Um, in the Lancer case, Lancer had, I mentioned there was an Eastern Bloc that had a lot of offshore transactions, probably 19 countries, 20 countries. The major law firm handling the case probably spent well over five or six million dollars in trying to get offshore accounts. They got no recovery. That reminds me on that particular case. When that case first came to the bankruptcy court, there was $80 million available for distribution. Over the 12 or 13 years, the law firm and their professionals racked up 40 million in fees, or more than 40 million in fees, because presently there's 40 million available for distribution. We're wrapping the case up right now. So had they closed the case 12 or 13 years ago, the people would have double what they're going to get now. And it's a case I think of attorneys, I won't say bleeding it, but not using their head. What's in it for us? I don't know how many times I got called over there for depositions for a matter that I would have said, it's costing you more to bring me over here for a deposition than what you're going to recover from this. What are you doing? Uh, you win? You want? What do you win? You want, you want a judgment. But put it on your wall, you know, put it with your certificates because you're not going to collect the damn thing on it. So, uh, that's about what, like I said, on the offshore. I don't even know if anybody really, I hear, I hear a lot of people talk about offshore. Uh, matter of fact, about the uh, mansion, a lot of people talk about, oh, we're good at offshore recoveries, we're good, we're, we used to be with the FBI. They didn't show me a thing. They didn't show me a thing, and these were supposedly the best in the business. Um, I guess i got a few minutes here. Any questions? <clears throat> yeah? Are you taking interns? What's that? Are you taking interns? <laughs> All work for free. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It, it's a lot of fun. I think you probably get a sense for it. I really enjoy it. I mean, I really enjoy it. I feel terrible for the people that got taken, uh, especially the, the local, what I'll call the local Ponzi schemes, where you get the blue collar retiree. It's really difficult to tell that guy that I'm sorry, but your $250,000 life savings, I might be able to get back 5,000 bucks. And uh, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's really heartbreaking. I, I tell people, they didn't steal his money. They stole his life. You know, it's one thing if you have a bunch of doctors that they're lose a couple million bucks and they're 34, 35 years old. Big deal. But you get that retiree, blue collar retiree with whole life savings. That's a big deal. To me, that's a real big deal. And uh, nothing does my heart better than to see somebody like Petters sitting up in uh, Minnesota in jail or Oaken sitting in jail for 100 years in Texas. I just, uh, there's, there is some justice in this world. But, again, it's a fun area. It is a fun area, and like I say, it's a growth area. It's the, the one really good thing. And I don't think I'm ever going to run out of Ponzi schemes. I'll buy you from the Ponzi schemes now. But if you get a chance, uh, there's a, it's called the Ponzi blog. You go to the Ponzi blog, and it's pretty interesting. Once a month, just to go all the new Ponzi schemes. And, uh, again, if, if you ever run across a Ponzi scheme, and you want help, give me a call. Not not because I'm looking for a case, 
but I've done this, we probably have been involved in well over 20 Ponzi schemes. I mean, I'd be more than happy to at least try and point you in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I have CLE credits for anybody that wants them. Um, is this going to be posted? You know? I think it is posted already. I think. Let's see if it'll focus. All right, here we go. Thank you. Oh, one other area. <laughs> like uh, this guy used to be a TV. Ejected. Oh. <laughs> Columbo. 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 <laughs> one other area. If you get involved in these, try early if they're big enough. Line yourself up with claims traders. Um, I've had claims traders in all my big bankruptcies. They can be your biggest ally uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're experienced. Most of these claims traders, the claims traders I deal with, are hedge funds. They've done their homework. They know more about this case than you do. And as importantly, if there's an asset there and you need money to go after that asset, that claims trader is probably also a good source for tip financing. So the claims traders, very helpful. A lot of people think claims traders are the scum of the earth, but three reasons for claims traders. Number one, I want to get rid of it. I'm a victim. I want out of this. I don't want mail from Mikhail every, every month for the rest of my life. I'll sell my thing to a claims trader. Number two, I want to establish a tax loss. One of the biggest headaches here is what is my tax loss and what is it defendant when it's defined. One way to define my tax loss is to go ahead and sell my claim to a claims trader. I now know what my loss is. Number three is what I call the hardship case. Mom's in the hospital, she's dying. We gotta get the she needs an operation, we need 40, 50 grand. I know I'm not gonna see any money from Mikhail for a couple of years. I go to the claim trader and I sell it. But the claims traders actually, although sometimes come in here to the people, on caution, I never give them any information that isn't on my website. I never give them any preferential treatment. They are just there. But having said that, when there's a big case and they're looking for a trustee, the claims traders have a tendency to say, we know this guy in Southwest Florida has done a pretty good job. Why don't we see if we can't get the local trustee's office hooked up with him? That's how I got the Sacramento case and the Virginia case. Um, Class action attorneys I've mentioned before. Get them early in case. Get them lined up. Uh, they won't do much, but you're better to have them on your side than against you. That's it. Thank you.